Today, we have the special privilege of welcoming a leader of innovation, Susan Wojcicki. As CEO of the world's most popular digital video platform, YouTube, Ms. Wojcicki has shaped the way over a billion users access digital media. YouTube is unique in the way that it allows small communities to interact with the global network, and Ms. Wojcicki's direction in YouTube's business operations will be critical in shaping the way the world will interact in the coming decades. In 1999, Ms. Wojcicki joined Google as the company's first marketing manager. Called the most important person in advertising, Ms. Swajitsky's supervision in pioneering Google Images and Google Books jump-started much of Google's initial success. As Senior Vice President of Advertising and Commerce, Ms. Swajitsky determined the vision and direction of Google's monetization platforms. According to Forbes, Wojcicki was responsible for 87% of the company's 50 billion in revenue, and she has repeatedly been selected by Forbes as one of the world's most powerful women. As we think about the future, Ms. Wojcicki's leadership and the innovation of new marketing strategies and her overall success as a company executive sets a distinguished example that all of us can admire and emulate. Please join me in welcoming our 2014 commencement speaker, Susan Wojcicki. Good morning, Johns Hopkins. It's a beautiful day. There's no rain. I've never checked the weather as much as I have this past week. Thank you, Sean, for that kind introduction. And thank you, President Daniels, for inviting me here to share this special day with all of you. Today is a big day, and I know everyone worked incredibly hard to make it happen. And I'm honored to be here to share it with you. Congratulations to the Board of Trustees, esteemed faculty, all the proud parents, supporting friends and family, but especially, let's give a big congratulations to the Blue Jay class of 2014. So I, I thought long and hard about what I wanted to say to all of you here today. I thought about my own commencement and commencement speaker. I thought about lessons learned, words of wisdom offered. And after thinking very deeply about it, I realized I remembered absolutely nothing from that speech. <laughs> Nada. So I will consider this talk a success if you remember just one thing. And here's the first thing you could remember. Setting achievable goals is important. So let's get started. It turns out that most of you were born the same year as the internet as we know it. You probably cannot imagine a world without texting, emailing, blogging, friending, tweeting, Googling, and yes, watching YouTube videos probably when you were supposed to be studying on D-level. <laughs> I just learned that. <laughs> Yet, none of those verbs existed when I was in my cap and gown. And now the world has over two billion people doing those things every day. Back then, only really bad things went viral. Like mono. <laughs> things you definitely did not want. Now things videos like David after dentist or Psy Gangnam Style or you know the recent video of cats rescuing kids from vicious dogs go viral. That proves it. The world has changed a lot since I graduated. The acceleration of technological progress is unmatched in our history and it's not going to slow down. It's only going to speed up. So I want to share a few stories, three stories from my life and how I, can, how I think they can help you in the new, fast-moving world that you're about to enter. I joined Google during the height of the first dot-com boom in the late 1990s. Now, I know this seems like ancient time to you guys, but it really was not that long ago. 
At the time, I was newly married, and my husband and I decided to buy a house, which was a huge decision. We could barely afford the mortgage, so we decided we would rent part of our house and the garage. Thanks to a mutual friend, we rented our garage to two graduate students at Stanford who had just started a company and were looking for office space. They seemed nice. <laughs> Their ideas sounded kind of crazy. Back then, no one had heard of Larry Page and Sergey Brin or the new company with the funny name. Google? What? What does that mean? It doesn't really matter. As long as you guys pay the rent on time, you guys can build your googly thing here. <laughs> Once they moved in, we had late nights together in the garage eating pizza and M&Ms, where they talked to me about how their technology could change the world. But then they would go on equally excited about the fact that my house had a washer and dryer. They made bold proclamations. We're going to organize the entire World Wide Web, followed by, which day is recycling day? <laughs> and when I asked them how much experience they had to back this ambitious plan, they would say, well, our combined age is almost 50. And they were entering a competitive area. There were many well-funded search engines, famous at the time, although you've probably never heard of them. Alta Vista, Lycos, Excite. Can you imagine if you wanted to search for something online and you had to say, I'm going to Alta Vista, the answer? That would be kind of awkward. <laughs> or let's go Excite that. <laughs> you guys should be grateful to Larry and Sergey for the name alone. So I was working at Intel at the time, and I think I can say this now. I thought they were crazy. But then one day, something funny happened at work. I opened up my browser to look something up, and it turned out that Google was down. There was an error page. And I sat there, and I couldn't get my work done, because I realized that no other search service could find the information. I had become dependent on Google for doing my day-to-day -day work. And then it hit me, if Google had become so indispensable to me, then maybe the vision that Larry and Sergey had wasn't so crazy. Maybe there were people all over the world sitting at their computers, upset right now, because they couldn't get what they needed done because the site developed by those two dudes in my garage was down. It turns out that finding information matters. It matters a lot to a lot of people. And accessing that information could instantly empower people across the globe. I decided I wanted to work for Google, which at the time also was crazy. With a mortgage to pay, student loans, I'd have to leave a comfortable job at a Fortune 500 company and work for the guys who lived in my garage at a startup with no revenue, a handful of male employees, and also did I mention I was pregnant? Now people thought I was a crazy one. So looking back on this, I've learned that life doesn't always present you with the perfect opportunity at the perfect time. Opportunities come when you least expect them or when you're not ready for them. Rarely are opportunities presented to you in the perfect way, in a nice little box with a yellow bow on top. Here, open it. It's perfect. You'll love it. Opportunities, the good ones, they're messy and confusing and hard to recognize. They're risky. They challenge you. But things happen so fast because our world is changing so much. You have to make decisions without perfect information. You have to make decisions based on the fact that the world is going to continue to change. Believe that the status quo will be supplanted by something better that someone's crazy business idea will become real and important. Belief that this technology, however small today, is going to be big in the future. It could make life better, easier, more meaningful for millions of people, maybe billions. Belief that this groundbreaking cancer research is going to save lives. Belief that next year, Johns Hopkins Lacrosse will win the national championship. <laughs> Look.
Look, I know that the opportunity I had with Google may seem one of a kind, but think how much our world has changed since you've all grown up. Think of the new companies, technologies, discoveries just in your lifetimes. Smartphones came out when you were in high school, and now you can't live without them. You can take your phone, take a video, share it on YouTube with a few clicks, and share it with the world. Take a picture, put a filter on it, share it with everyone you know, all while listening to your music that's in the cloud. In fact, you guys could be doing this right now. So instead of saying not to do that, if you are doing it, just say something nice about my talk. <laughs> Hashtag JHU2014. And it's not just the web, genomics, nanotechnology, bioinformatics, health medicine, all parts of society. <laughs> you will have opportunities you cannot even imagine right now. So here's the one thing you could choose to remember. It's those opportunities, the ones that make you believe in the future. Those will be the best ones. Those are the ones that can change your life, and those are the ones that can change the world. So now I want to talk about YouTube. Do you guys use YouTube? I want to talk about how I first discovered it and then almost lost it. It's a story about recognizing an opportunity, but also about facing failure. I know it's hard to believe, but in 2004, there was no YouTube. And video on the internet was rare. We were trying to figure out the right strategy for Google to be in the online video business. We were trying lots of different things and nothing was getting traction. And one day, we decided we would allow users to upload their video to Google. We didn't tell users what would happen to their videos. And we had no ideas what users would send to us. It was an experiment in every sense. But amazingly, people all over the world uploaded lots and lots and lots of video. And it just went into a database at Google that nobody could see. So a Friday night later, we got together and decided we'd watch some of these videos and see what should we do with this new experiment. We opened the first video and waited. It was of a purple furry puppet dancing and singing in Swedish. <laughs> You know, just what we're used to watching on TV. It was probably one of the first user-generated videos anyone had ever seen. And honestly, I had no idea what to think. But my kids knew what to think. They cheered. Play it again! We played that video a lot. The videos were unusual. I hadn't seen anything like it before. They were interesting and funny, and more importantly, everyone wanted to see more of them. We started building out a platform called Google Video for users to upload and see their videos. And every day we were getting more and more uploads to Google Video. We had our first hit, and it wasn't from where you thought it would be from. It was two college students, two Chinese college students in their dorm room, singing and dancing to the Backstreet Boys with their roommate doing their homework in the background. <laughs> and in spite of this, it became the first video to reach one million views, which was a lot back then. That clip gave us an insight about the future of video. We realized online video was a new medium, that it could unleash the creativity of people all over the world, and also spark the curiosity of people who wanted to watch them. And even though we knew this was early, it had the potential to be big. But soon after we had our initial success with Google Video, another site launched, YouTube. And it started growing faster, a lot faster. And all of a sudden, we saw our newfound success slipping away. And just after we thought we were winning, we found out that we were losing. We were scared and confused. Very quickly, I had to make a tough call. Do we pretend that things are OK and try to fix them and continue to build out Google Video and hope we catch up? Or do we admit our failure and look to acquire YouTube, a company with no revenue, lots of legal liability, 
it was only a year old and pay 1.6 billion for it? And just as we are making this decision, as if it was not hard enough, an industry veteran, an internet investor, published a well-read article saying, only a moron would buy YouTube. <laughs> well, you know how this ended. I guess you can call me a moron. But I had to go to our founders and our board and tell them the product that we'd spent so much time building, Google Video, was losing. And we would have to spend over a billion and a half to fix the mistake. It was painful, it was public. It was one of the hardest decisions that I've had to make. People on my team quit in revolt. But acting fast, facing up to the problem, making a decision, buying YouTube, and then investing heavily in it, was also one of the best decisions that we've ever made. Today, YouTube has over a billion users around the world, with 180 hours uploaded every single minute. It's been used to develop stars like Michelle Phan, Smosh, Macklemore, and Justin Bieber, although we won't dwell on that one for too long. <laughs> it's helped grow companies like Vice, GoPro, and it's shined light on political strife in places like Egypt, Venezuela, and most recently, Ukraine. The global community shares songs like Pharrell's Happy and videos like, well, like this one. Con los terroristas. <laughs> That's a shortened version. That's in, that li in the library. Um, anyway, you guys are talented, very talented. Um, that's really good shaking. YouTube, over a relatively short period of time, has become the primary platform for people to entertain, dance, just like that, sing, laugh, love, learn. If I hadn't owned up to my mistake and confronted failure fast, instead of ignoring it, I would not be here today. So maybe another possible thing for you guys to remember, see, I'm trying to help you guys. When you fail, face your failure. Face it head on, admit it, grow from it. When the world spins so fast, it means no one knows what the right answer is and everyone will face failure. Ideas that were once can't miss, missed. Companies that were surefire went down in flames. It's what you do when that happens that determines who ultimately succeeds and who does not. Failure is part of the process. It's where we learn the most, and it's what makes us who we are. Now, as I look out at all of you, I'm reminded of my own graduation. I remember there were an awful lot of question marks for me. Graduating meant leaving behind my friends, my college life. It meant I'd have to figure out what to do with my real, my real life. And I had no idea what I was going to do. I had no job lined up, no prospects. My big plan was to go home, live with my parents, and share the family car with my little sister. <laughs> now to some of you, that might sound like a strange fear. Hopkins is a unique place, and that some of you have known exactly what you've wanted to do since you set foot on this campus. Many of you have useful degrees. Biomedical engineering. <laughs> Public health. Economics. <laughs> applied math. Computer science. What else am I missing? Okay, all those others, those two. Those are useful degrees. I had a degree in history and literature. I, which is a great degree too, 
But there's some of the least practical majors, and I combine them. And it's not like I didn't have ideas about what to do after graduating. I had too many. I thought about taking the foreign service exam, about spending life as a diplomat. I even thought about medical school and how I could save sick people. But then I also thought about waiting tables and maybe opening a cupcake shop. But in the meantime, I needed inter my life intervened. I became practical. I needed money after graduation, and my parents were not going to pay my way anymore. I stopped worrying about getting the right job, and I focused on just getting a job. And although it was quite difficult at the time, I need to thank my parents for forcing me out into the workforce. My mom and dad are here today. So thank you, mom and dad, for making me get up, get out, and do something. With programming under my belt, I found work for a small educational startup in Palo Alto. And I discovered that technology was creative. I could build things for people all over the world. It was the start of a journey that has led me to incredible places. But it was never my plan. So maybe one thing more to try to remember is plans are made to be broken. You need to be prepared to explore a bit, to make decisions on what you find, enjoy, discover. I never would have experienced any of that. I never would have discovered that technology could be creative. I never would have started my career in tech, joined Google, led YouTube, if I would tried to stick to a specific plan that I had made when I was your age. The internet as we know it didn't exist yet when I graduated. We need to think about our plans being written in pencil, not pen, willing to change as the world changes and as we change. I guarantee you, you will change course, go backwards, spring forward, bounce sideways. Some of you will need to adjust the plans that you currently have because they'll turn out to be the wrong fit. Some of you will start a business. You have no idea right now that the world needs. Some of you will fall in love and move halfway across the world. Some of you could open a cupcake shop. Thank you in advance to those people. <laughs> There's the old John Lennon quote, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. So as you sit there and look around and say, man, I still have a lot to figure out. I don't know exactly where I'm headed. Just know that's okay. And your parents should hear that too, it's okay. If your parents have concerns, they can talk to my parents. They're right over there in the front row. My parents could probably write a book of their own about their three crazy daughter and the journeys that we took along the way, a journey that encompassed babysitting, investment banking, trips across Siberia, learning Swahili, studying childhood obesity, and starting a personal genomics company. So far, we've turned out OK. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our parents and those who have supported us to get to this point so far. And thank them in advance for their support as you fumble, fidget, and yes, fail sometimes, and figure out the right path for you. But wherever that path goes, I promise it couldn't happen without the people supporting you, filling this stadium, who encourage and inspire you to get there. So let's give them all a big thanks now. If you had told the Hopkins class when I graduated that the world would be transformed by the internet, that two billion people would be connected online, that you would find all the world's knowledge in your pocket, that you could map full genomes for a few thousand dollars, that you could de develop touchscreen technology that you could talk to, like in Star Trek, no one would have believed you. Well, actually, this is Hopkins. So there probably would have been a few who would have said, duh, we knew that was going to happen. Um, but anyway, for most of us, the future was beyond our imagination, as it is beyond yours. 
So you, this class, this generation that's grown up in a digital world, you understand the power of connection like no other class that came before you. You can make an impact far greater than the engineers and doctors and physicists and governors and writers and cabinet secretaries and 22 Nobel laureates who came before you on this campus. Yes, you, all of you here wearing those black hats and black robes, you have opportunities that none of them could have imagined. And now you have an education that will allow you to design and create the future for all of us. The world is spinning faster, but it's at your fingertips. You can spin it for yourselves. You, as Blue Jays, can soar. So remember this, if you remember nothing else, you can be the crazy kid in some lady's garage going on and on and on about how you're gonna change the world, and then you can go out and actually do it. So thank you and congratulations, Johns Hopkins class of 2014. Keep on shaking.